candidate for the presidency of Western Kentucky University. The Board of Regents has made this opportunity available to the entire campus community for two primary purposes. First of all, for the constituency here at Western to have an opportunity to interact with each of the candidates, and secondly, for you as the attendees to provide feedback to the board. The format will begin with comments by the candidate, followed by questions from the audience so that both the candidate and the audience can clearly hear the question we ask that you use either the stand mic in the center of the auditorium or raise your hand and a wireless mic will be brought to you as you entered the auditorium you were given a form that we would like for you to complete to provide feedback to the board you may turn it in at the door at the conclusion of this session or you can use one of the methods listed at the bottom of the sheet to return it to me. And now to introduce our candidate. Dr. Edward H. Hammond is a native of Texas and spent his early years in the Kansas City, Kansas area. From Kansas State Teachers College, currently known as Emporia State University, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in speech and a Master of Science degree in guidance and counseling. His PhD in counseling and personnel services was earned at the University of Missouri where he also attended their School of Law. Dr. Hammond began his career in higher education as a research assistant to the president of Kansas State Teachers College, then as assistant director of field services. He served as director of student affairs at Purdue University and as an NDA fellow at the University of Missouri. Throughout the 70s, Dr. Hammond served in various student affairs roles, including assistant to the president for student relations at Southern Illinois University and vice president for student affairs at Seton Hall University before coming to the Commonwealth as the vice president for student affairs at the University of Louisville, a position he held for 11 years. In 1987, Dr. Hammond was named as the eighth president of Fort Hayes State University where he also has status as professor of education. While at Fort Hayes, Dr. Hammond has been instrumental in computerizing the campus environment, informing the Western Kansas Educational Compact, the Western Kansas Coalition for Economic Development, cooperative bilingual teacher education programs, and active in fundraising. Dr. Hammond lives in Hayes, Kansas with his wife, Vivian. They have three children, daughter Kelly, who is married, and Julie, and a son, Lance. And Mrs. Hammond has indicated that she would be pleased to accept questions from the audience. Please welcome with me, Dr. Ed Hammond. Thank you very much. Can you all hear okay if I don't use that microphone back? It's, uh, Viv and I are just so happy to be back in, uh, in the Commonwealth again. We enjoyed our 11 years at the University of Louisville very, very much, and uh, in fact, raised our family basically in, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And so this is a, is a real treat. During that time that I was at the University of Louisville, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, visit Western Kentucky University, uh, and uh, I had at that time, I guess, uh, and still do, a very strong feeling about the potential of this institution, not only in the Commonwealth, but in the area as well. Uh, the reason why I'm interested in the presidency, to try to jump some of the questions that, that uh, you may be asking, is that I perceive that this institution, at this time, is going to be making some major decisions, and to have the opportunity to be in a leadership role at this time is tremendously challenging. Not only this institution, but all of post-secondary education is going through some significant change. In fact, if you stop and think about it, there have only been, you know, four ages in the history of man on this planet. A hunting and gathering age, which lasted millions of years, followed by an agricultural age, which lasted thousands of years, followed by an industrial age that lasted at best 200 years. And now we're in an information age that started about 1960 and I believe will be over about 2020. Same things have happened in all of those ages, the only thing is it's getting a lot more compressed. What used to take 100 years is now taking a year, what used to take a year is now taking a week to accomplish. That fact that, the, that change is speeding up at a phenomenal rate 
is making obsolete a lot of the assumptions that we've made about post-secondary education in the past. For example, we used to believe that you go to elementary school once, and you go to high school once, then you go to college, and then you go off and practice whatever profession that you were interested in pursuing. That no longer is a model that is acceptable in our society today. Change is going to eliminate professions, is going to eliminate whole job categories, is going to demand that people pursue learning on a lifelong basis. The current estimate is that uh, the freshman on the Hill this year will have four totally different careers. We'll need to access post-secondary education in this state, in this commonwealth, three or four completely different times. Basically, most institutions have about a 10-year window, I believe, to make the necessary adjustments, to make the necessary adjustments so that they can, in effect, uh, manage change within that institution and position them to be a real value to their citizens. And one of the things that excites me most is Governor Patton's reorganizational plan for governance and for operation of the universities in the state of Kentucky because it's one of the few state, if not the only state, in which total coordination of those resources are going to be brought to bear to make a significant difference in this state's ability to meet the educational needs of its citizens. And that's the reason why I'm here. I believe the state is serious about such a commitment. I believe Western is uniquely positioned to be a primary post-secondary educational provider, not only in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, but in this region of the country. The key to doing that is whether or not we can manage change more effectively as an institution than other institutions. Whether we can develop the delivery vehicles to meet the needs of the students in the future better than some other institutions. What we call non-traditional students are going to be the vast majority of the students that we serve. You see, when students come back into the educational environment for the second and third time, they're not going to be geographically mobile. They're not going to be able to pick up necessarily and move to Bowling Green or to Lexington or to Richmond or to Murray. And this institution to, is exciting to me because it's positioned to be a major provider in that kind of environment. And I believe the faculty, you the faculty that are here today, are committed to teaching are committed to what I call a high-touch emphasis. Western Kentucky University has always been proud of its personalized attempt to meet the needs of its students. If we can merge that high-touch emphasis with an integration of technology or high-tech, we can create a special learning environment that will make us attractive, will make us effective, and will make us efficient more than any other institution in this commonwealth or in this region. The ability to do that depends upon our will to do it. The ability to do it depends upon the leadership that you, and if I'm selected, that I can provide this institution. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm happy to be here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have, and I'm sure that you have a number of them that you would like to pursue, either regarding those remarks or other things that you would like to learn about me. So let's open it up to questions and see what areas of interest you have. Questions? Have you already made some of these changes at Fort Hayes State, or is, is the institution uh, smaller or different and not going to go through that kind of evolution? In other words, why wouldn't you stay to do the same things there or just, just kind of explain that a little further. Okay, good. that's a very good question. And it's really three questions. That's a good faculty question. It has three parts to it. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Faculty only think in, in trinities, you know. It's a, the, uh, the first question is, have we already done it at Fort Hay State University? The answer is yes. We have what we call an electronic learning environment. We guarantee that every graduate of our institution, regardless of major, graduates computer literate and computer flexible. Since 1988, we computerized all of our residence halls. That not only means we wired them so if the students bring their computers, they can plug them into our system, but we've been providing computing in the residence halls. On every floor, we have mini labs. Uh, we started putting them in the rooms, and the students said, we don't like them in the rooms. Uh, can you put them someplace else? Uh, because there was a conflict. One student in the room wanted to study, the other one didn't, and so we've 
in effect, for ease, we took out uh, one and stripped out one of the rooms and stacked them on top of one another in our dorms and wired them so that it was a little more inexpensive to wire that way. And we brought the computing in and put it in there. We're in our third generation of upgrading that computing in the residence hall since 1988. Uh, all faculty have had computers since 1989. Uh, we're in our third generation of faculty upgrades. Um, we, we deliver courses now to 57 sites in the western half of the state of Cam uh, Kansas on two-way interactive full motion video. We deliver courses via videotape and internet. Uh, we have 900 students pursuing degrees that will never set foot on our campus. So I think I can safely say that we are doing at Fort Hayes the kind of thing that I believe needs to be done for an institution in order to position itself to be successful in the next century. Then the second part of your question is, why would I want to leave if we have all of those things going on? And the answer is the state of Kansas as a state is not committed to doing it. And the next step is going to take a coordinated effort of all of the institutions in the state in order to reach its full potential. Because you're going to have to build on your strengths because we can't continue to be all things to all people. If one institution tries to make that critical sea change by itself, it may be able to pull it off to a point, but it's not going to be able to have the impact on the, co on the Commonwealth of the state of Kansas. And so the decision that the governor made, and I was a little leery when the governor said, this is what I want to do. But when he decided to do what he did with the community colleges, that showed me he was dead serious and I want to be part of that because I believe where post-secondary education is going in this state, we can reach the optimum in terms of efficiency and effectiveness and delivering services and meeting the needs of students and citizens in this state. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes, all the way in back. We're going to get, uh, we'll get you in shape running up and down. <laughs> Dr. Hammond, can you tell me and tell the rest of us here in the audience today where you see international education as fitting in, uh, at Western Kentucky University? And by that I mean not only study abroad for American students, but international students on campus. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer the question directly where I see it fitting at Western Kentucky University because I'm not an expert on Western Kentucky University. Um, and, you know, some of the candidates that you have are more knowledgeable about Western than I am right now. And, and I don't like to make decisions without consulting and without getting input, so I'm reluctant to answer the question directly, but let me answer it indirectly <coughs> by saying that I believe very much in internationalizing the curriculum. In fact, if you go back and do research at Fort Hayes, you know that I proposed and discussed with the faculty a foreign language requirement for all degrees at Fort Hayes State University. The faculty decided they didn't want to do it for all degrees, but we have certain degrees that require a foreign language requirement. I believe that's a fundamental weakness in the workforce and in the citizens of this country that they're not bilingual, and, uh, and I would think it would strengthen the curriculum if that were to be the case. But again, it's, I believe, in operating in a partnership with the faculty, and some of the faculty was reluctant. They thought they would be at a competitive disadvantage if they required foreign language in some of those areas. School of Business, for example, because of the number of hours that they need to have in their curriculum, we're reluctant about adding it to the business uh, degrees. And, uh, and even though I disagree and I think business graduates need to be as bilingual as teachers um, in teacher ed program, they are bilingual at our institution, but in the School of Business, they're not yet. I haven't given up on that. I think we'll continue to work on that. Uh, but right now that isn't the case. So I'm a strong believer in internationalizing the curriculum. Now, does that mean they all have to travel overseas? No. Uh, but I do believe there are some exciting things that can be done, and I give our faculty full credit for creativity in terms of how they're beginning to, to cope with that. We set that as an objective, uh, a way we like to add value to all of our degrees. I like to spend resources in ways in which uh, it maximizes the value of all degrees, not just a degree in one area. When we made the decision as an institution to computerize our environment so that everyone graduates computer literate and computer flexible, that impacted every degree from nursing to art to political science to history, didn't matter. We made a decision to internationalize the curriculum as well. And uh, different units have approached that task differently 
For example, some uh, colleges and degree programs coordinate their uh, foreign language, their geography course, and their history course to function on one area of the world. So if they're studying Spanish, they may take a history course that it emphasizes a particular area in the world in which Spanish is a speaking language, and they, uh, and they may even look at ge geography in that particular area or some other discipline, where they try to coordinate the, uh, the offerings to create within the curriculum for the student a better and more in-depth penetration of an international understanding. I compliment the faculty for that and, and support that effort. Does that answer your question? Next. Yes. Yes, Dr. Hammond, would you please uh, tell us a little bit about your managerial style? In other words, how you envision working with faculty, working with your uh, vice presidents, your deans, and relating to the students? Okay. Uh, they've all asked that same question, so I guess I should have covered that in my, in my remarks. I believe that, the, that a leader on a campus in which what a president is, um, let me define leadership for you in terms of what I believe leadership is. I believe leadership is an influential relationship. Uh, it's not a coercive relationship. It's not a demanding relationship. It's an infra it's a, uh, uh, influential relationship among leaders and followers that uh, intend real change and that that change is agreed upon in some kind of consensus. It's real important that there is that kind of consensus and I spend a lot of time on my campus, and if I were here, I'd spend a lot of time making sure we have the kind of consensus necessary to move forward. Because without it, you lose your vision. You need to have the consensus. So we work very closely with faculty in our strategic planning process. We work very closely with students and staff. Uh, and uh, I have a standing open door policy with any faculty member that wants to come see me. In addition, I take the time every year, I go and I meet with every department in the university. I go to their office and I sit down with the math department or the history department and we spend about two hours talking about whatever they want to talk about. I believe one of the real challenges in managing an institution is making sure lines of communication are open and uh, sharing information. I've yet to find a faculty group that if they have all the facts that I have when I have to make a decision don't agree with the decision that I make. But if you don't have the facts and you hear, well, the president did X, Y, or Z, you're going to probably wonder, why in the heck did he do that? So sharing information and communicating is a critical part of my concept of leadership and building consensus around the objectives and the vision of the institution are, are <coughs> critical components. And uh, if, you, if you're like my faculty, you, you hear that but you don't believe it, pick the phone up and call my faculty. You all have counterparts there. They'll probably tell you that, as they've been telling me, they don't want me to leave. They'll probably tell you I got a tail and two heads, but then they'll probably be honest about our relationship. Any other questions? Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. It sounds like you've studied uh, the reform a little bit, so can you tell us how our community college at Western Kentucky University is going to fit into that picture, either as part of, or as overlapping, or as separate? Well, as I said, I'm not an expert on Western Kentucky, but I have read the legislation and listened to some speeches the governor has given. Uh, I think the Western Kentucky University Community College was intentionally left out of the out of the consolidation of the community college uh, uh, effort. And I think it was done for a reason that the regional institutions, uh, which I think clearly were classified as under that bill, uh, is seen as an access point. Uh, and yet, Western Kentucky University is trying to make sure that we have quality and we have standards. And so the community college component of this institution and this is my supposition, I can't speak for the governor, that I think wasn't included in the merger to provide Western the vehicle to accommodate citizens who may not be accommodated if it weren't an option in developing some of those basic skills for success. Uh, I don't know how many remedial courses you all offer um, in your regular curriculum. We call them O-level courses because they're O-14 or O-15 
they aren't college credit courses as such, but uh, my belief is that that may be an excellent vehicle to help not only do that, but to transition people uh, who are thinking about going on and getting a degree, as well as a vehicle maybe for uh, some distance learning kind of option. Uh, but it's not addressed in the, in the legislation or in any of the discussions that I've seen. And I have to believe it was intentional. Other questions? Over here. Dr. Hammond, as members of the staff here at Western, we have seen several of our groups privatized over the years. Uh, some feel that that has weakened morale on campus, and we also feel that there is no group safe on campus. Could you give us our views, uh, your views on privatization? Uh, yes, I am opposed to privatization. I'm not a big fan of it. I think it's an excuse to cover for bad management. The, uh, um, every example that I've seen of privatization has been not generated by bottom line dollars, but by an attempt of instead of changing personnel or doing something well, it's just as easy to privatize it as to deal with the management problem. I don't operate that way. I deal with management problems if they are there. And then there's not a need to privatize unless that partnership will bring significant strategic objective to the table, uh, expertise that you don't have on campus. Um, so I've studied privatization while I was at Louisville. I studied it when I was at, uh, when I, now that I've been at Fort Hayes. I've never privatized a unit uh, in any institution I've been at, and uh, so I'm not a big fan of that. It, and, and primarily because of what you talked about. If, if I'm trying to develop a special kind of environment on campus, takes the very best of high touch in the family atmosphere. If that's really my goal and objective, privatization has proven every place that it's done it that it creates real morale problems. It's a lot better to deal with the management problem up front and to get the kind of efficiencies and effective that way without contributing profits to another company. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, based on your experience with uh, distance learning, uh, tell us a bit about the impact it's had perhaps on oh, faculty workloads, e efficiency, uh, and maybe uh, effectiveness of student learning. Uh, the question is, did everyone hear the question? Could you hear the question in back? Okay. The, the answer then, first of all, let's do it in reverse order. That's another Trinity question. Uh, the answer, first of all, does it improve learning? The answer is yes. Uh, we've done research that indicates that our students learn more and retain more in mediated class format, mediated classrooms than they do in traditional classrooms. Now, some of that may be uh, you know, a Hawthorne effect or, or a number of other things that are playing there. We haven't gone in to isolate exactly what it is, but we know more learning takes place and more retention takes place. Uh, in our distance learning environment, we find that the students learn as well not necessarily better, but as well in terms of full motion two-way interactive video. Now, it's my understanding here we're using compressed video, uh, and that's got a certain distortion to it. And in our research, research we did research on compressed video, full motion video, uh, and we did telenet uh, broadcasts as well, uh, which is an ATM format. And uh, we found that the students liked and learned better with full motion video than the other two modalities. And the reason is it's closest to network TV that they watch every day during the week. And it was kind of interesting. We take the same faculty member, we put them and we compress them to one site and did them full motion to another site. Exactly the same lectures, exactly the same material. The compressed site rated the faculty member significantly less than the faculty than the site that was full motion. And the reason was not because the quality of what he said was distorted in any way, but the picture wasn't as clear. And so the students psychologically believed they weren't getting as good a product. And uh, you know, I, how do you explain that? I don't know, but we've done that research. So the answer to your third question is clearly that there's a positive to mediated classrooms and to using technology effectively to teach. The uh, second question that you asked had to do with uh, my experience in distance learning and whether or not uh, uh, what, what, faculty workload. 
right and whether that changed the faculty workload. It can or it can't, depends on how it's structured. At our institution, we sat down with the faculty and we have a base. Uh, when I first went to Fort Hay State University, we sat down and said, let's define what a faculty member is at the institution. And we sat down with the faculty and we defined the faculty member at our institution as being one that is 60-20-20. Uh, 60% uh, instruction, 20% research, 20% service. We defined that that 20% was equivalent to 12 credit hours. And if someone teaches in a mediated environment on campus uh, and has students in Dodge City and Garden City and Liberal, what we restrict, our faculty only teach to one home site and four other sites at a single time. We find if we go to more sites than that at simultaneously, it's really difficult for them to, uh, to personalize the instruction. Um, even if they only have three or four people in a site. Uh, we count that, at our institution, we count that as a, uh, as a regular three-hour load, whether they are teaching 20 or 30 people in a classroom or 10 people in this classroom in five years or somewhere else. So mediated classes can count on the base contract as well. But if a faculty member wants to teach offload, and a number of our faculty members are looking at that option doing that now, uh, they're developing mediated courses, internet courses, videotape courses. Uh, we have, we've been wrestling, and I think you probably have wrestled with it too, most faculties have, and that's intellectual property rights. Who owns that product, and how is a faculty member adequately rewarded for that product? Uh, and, uh, and we've come to the conclusion at our institution, our faculty uh, and I, that we both own it. The faculty member, it's a joint partnership. The faculty member leaves and goes to the University of Kansas, he can take that material with him. He can take that course with him. But we can continue to do, use the course as well, since it was developed under our dollar and on our time when we were paying that faculty member. But if the faculty member wants to teach that course, or if the course is offered, he can teach it accepted offline. And I believe that I'll have faculty at Fort Hay State University who will make $30,000 offline with their internet courses and their two-way interactive video courses within three years, in addition to their, to their regular contract with us at the university. Now, in order to make that work, those faculty may have to buy back some of that teaching. And we've agreed to a $2,500 cost so they could pay, they could take $5,000 of the revenue that they're generating in the, in the off-campus internet environment or the two-way interactive environment, and in effect buy down two of the courses that they would normally have on campus. And that's, we just kind of sat down and worked this out. There isn't any magic answer to this, but what we wanted to do was to truly reward faculty for entrepreneurial efforts in developing courses and to clearly define who owns what in the process. Does that answer your question? I think all three. Um, Dr. Hammond, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed some of your earlier comments, but um, as you... You are probably teaching, which is more important. <laughs> we won't go into details on that, but... <laughs> 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 um, if, let's assume that you were president of Western Kentucky University for... I like that assumption. Uh, <laughs> say the next five years. At, at the end of that five years, th this is my question. Is there one thing in your mind perhaps one dream or one vision or one idea, one goal, that you feel if you could have achieved that in your first five years, you would be really satisfied and, y and you would feel that uh, this was a, a very positive thing for Weston. And if there is such, I'd be interested to hear what it is. Very, very nice question. I like that. Uh, very thoughtful, too. I, I, I think if five years from now, if we have an educational environment at Western, that is significantly different than any other educational institution in the state and produces a quality product uh, that is attractive to students, I would be tickle pink to be called president at Western Kentucky University. Now that may mean we have to significantly reduce our teaching, uh, our faculty student ratio, may mean we need to significantly upgrade our facilities to to uh, integrate technology more effectively. It, I'm, I'm not sure how we would get there, but I would pledge that I would sit down and work with you as faculty to define 
what that objective is, and then we would use whatever resources we need to, do, to uh, take to accomplish that end. That's the way I would work. But that would make me very happy if five years from now, students are coming to Western Kentucky University because the environment here is unlike any other environment and at any other school, and the kind of education they're getting here from you, the faculty, is of the kind of quality that they would want to be here. I think if we did that, the future of this institution would be guaranteed well into the next century. Other questions? I haven't thought through all the implications of this question, so I hope you'll bear with me if it's not uh, well phrased or well thought out. You but mean you ha before you ask a question, you have to think it through? <laughs> First time I've asked it. Oh, Several okay. of the other questions have been asked three times oh, already. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, okay. I was going to say, this faculty is <laughs> a lot more polite than mine. Right? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to think through, as, as are a lot of people these days, about the implications of, of education over the internet, uh, distance learning, et cetera. And being a traditionalist in the sense that I've taught in the classroom, as many of us have now for many years here, uh, trying to envision what is gained and lost uh, by this new educational process. Uh, trying to get a sense of what degree, if we chase it, are we chasing fads? To what degree are we going to create modalities which are essential? Uh, I am particularly concerned about the personal aspects of education being retained. Ha counseling, inspiring, helping students develop their values, uh, the mentoring-mentee relationship, which is so critical, and whether these can be retained uh, with a complete educational system which is offered uh, through distance learning processes. And I, I, I wonder if you can comment on exactly how far you think we ought to go in that direction. Uh, uh, your question addresses the Internet, and I'm very leery of, of betting on the internet as a solution for uh, distance learning. Because in my discussions with CEOs of major companies and personnel managers of major companies, there's a real, um, how can I say it nicely, but uh, there's a reluctance to believe that what's learned in that environment is truly learned. And part of the problem is it's hard to identify that the student that contracted for the course on the internet is really the one taking the course. Uh, and so, for example, Purdue University and a number of universities that have offered move to doing MBA programs uh, on the Internet have now added components where those students have to come to the campus for two weeks in the summer, uh, where you can do the assessment and where you can ascertain whether or not they're really learning the material that they should be learning. Uh, so I don't believe the Internet is the panacea that some institutions are, are believed. I think it's a tremendous support vehicle for classes. It's a great way for you to get information to students and have information out there for students. But I'm a little leery as, that, uh, as far as that vehicle is concerned of being a sole delivery vehicle because I'm not sure we can credential it uh, well enough right now. Um, so I'd be reluctant. And at Fort Hay State University, we have some internet courses uh, that the faculty have wanted to pursue that we've supported it. But we've constantly asked the question, how are you going to assess the student in that internet process. And, uh, and we're not the only institution wrestling with that. Does that address your question? Yes. I understand that in the student meeting you talked about the uh, four-year guarantee that you have at Fort Hayes, and I wondered if you would tell how that works and why you suppose um, institutions like Western are not graduating students in four years routinely. Okay, well, that's, uh, there's two questions. I can't answer the second one. I don't know why it isn't, why Western isn't graduating. I can tell you what we found when we went to Fort Hayes. Uh, we wanted to increase the percentage of students graduating, and we're up to about 45, 44, 45 percent of our incoming freshmen end up getting degrees from our institution. We think that's good. Uh, that was a goal that we set to work on and improve, and we've achieved that. We want to, we'd like to do even better. But when we looked at it, we found that only about 20 percent were graduating in four years, and another 23, 4 percent were taking five, six, or seven years. And that's a tremendous waste of resources, both in, on the part of students 
and families who now have to pay for a fifth year. It's a tremendous waste of resources for the state because now they're going to have to support this student instead of bringing in a new student. And it's a tremendous waste on faculty because we aren't able to maximize the efficiency of our faculty because you're teaching the same students for a lot longer period of time. So we've looked and we said, okay, as a, as a university, we want to do something about it. How do we go about doing it? Well, the first thing we did was we looked at the degree programs. And all of our faculty uh, worked to, make, to uh, define an undergraduate degree program, and we defined it as a degree program of 124 to 128 semester hours. And we believed that that was achievable within four years. But what had happened over time at our institution, and I've not looked at your institution, but what happened at our institution was over the years they'd add this course, and then they'd add that course, and then they'd add this course, and then they'd add that course, and we never take away anything, but we'll add something. And over time, a lot of our, quote, four-year baccalaureate degrees were running 132, 134 hours. So the challenge then to the faculty was, okay, if we're going to offer this, here's your options. You can make your baccalaureate degree program a four-year program. It needs to be 124 to 128 hours. You have an option of saying it's a five-year degree program. But let's be honest up front with people. It's going to take, like, for example, uh, music because of accreditation and other things. It's impossible to do the music program in four years. Um, and so that's a five-year program. Um, uh, let's see, another one, uh, oh, the third option is you can make it a master's program. And that's what happened in accounting. The CPA, I'm sure the business people know that just recently, in the last few years, there's been a change for what you have to take in order to sit for the CPA exam. You now have to take 150 hours in order to sit for the CPA exam. Well, 150 hours is not a baccalaureate degree. And so we've moved that to the master's of accountancy level and you, have, and you actually pursue a master's degree in order to complete the hours for, for accounting. But all of the other degree programs, our faculty re-engineered their programs, and some didn't have much to do, and some had some significant decisions to make about how they got the curriculum into the 124 to 128 hours. And once the faculty had completed that, on the student affairs side, we were mounting the kind of systems necessary to support uh, a good advising model. We had a degree audit check system that was in place. So if a student walks in a faculty member's office, you could just spin around, enter the student's uh, ID code, and up would come their record, and you would enter a degree program, and the computer would tell you exactly what's missing in order for that student to graduate. Uh, and we provided the faculty test data and other kind of data, and we did some training with our faculty so that they could become more efficient in the advising process, because faculty are key to advising at our institution. Once that was done, then we were able to go out to the students and say to students, we'll enter into a separate contract with you. And if you come to our institution and want to pursue a four-year degree, we guarantee that you'll graduate in four years or we'll pay for the fifth. So if we foul up and misadvise, or we don't schedule the courses in the right sequence, or whatever the case is, and you have to stay, and it's our fault, we'll pay for that. And that has been received amazingly well uh, in, the, in the state. Now, the faculty like it too, because there's, like most contracts, there's two sides to it. The student has to pass all the courses, meet the minimum grade requirements, can't drop any courses, and has to have a major by the end of their freshman year. And that, all of a sudden, there's a few other things. But what it says to the student is, you're responsible for doing these things, and if you do these things, it's reasonable to expect that you're going to graduate in four years. And, uh, and that's been just, uh, we've only been doing it a couple of years, but that's been very, very effective. Now, I'm not saying that that's appropriate for Western. Uh, we'd have to look at that. But I w those are the kind of creative things that add value to degrees and add value to the institution that we, you know, we would need to look at as a faculty and as an institution. Does that answer your question? It took about four years working with the faculty to get all that done. Re-engineering degrees, putting the systems in place, and uh, accomplishing those objectives. Yes, sir. I had a question uh, in your philosophy on faculty contract status. One, uh, what's your sense of the right mix between 
full-time and part-time faculty. And among the full-time faculty, how committed are you to the traditional tenure system as opposed to alternate uh, kinds of contract statuses for full-time faculty? Um, let me answer the tenure one first. I, I believe the tenure model is, is, uh, is necessary to support the kind of morale and the kind of environment that I consider to be a collegial environment. Um, yeah, we could do away with it. We could write contracts in a different way with faculty. But we don't pay faculty what they're worth. And one of the things that we do in place of not paying faculty historically is we try to provide them some flexibility and freedom uh, that's resulting from, from tenure. And so I'm not one of the presidents that's saying, let's change tenure. And we've made no, mo no move at Fort Hayes State to do that. Uh, your second question had to do with, with uh, the percentage of faculty, full-time faculty versus part-time faculty. I would love to have all faculty be full-time faculty. The reality is that is impossible. We did uh, 44 searches uh, this year for full-time faculty, and, uh, and there were a number of them where we couldn't find the people we were really totally wanting to bring on board. And so we'll hire a temporary faculty member for a year. Um, we use part-time faculty when we give faculty release time. Uh, and uh, to go work on an internet course or to do something else. We'll cut, try to cover their classes with part-time people or if someone gets sick. But I don't believe it's healthy for the institution uh, if we're really developing a partnership with the faculty to try to use part-time faculty as a way to save money. And that's what some institutions have tried to do. Does that answer your question? And it's a real simple reason. You may save money, but you destroy the fiber, really, of the institution by doing that. And you lose, I think, the creativity that, the, that a full-time faculty member brings to the process. Full-time faculty are better advisors. They're better mentors. They're better recruiters. And faculty are going to have to be more involved in, that, in those kind of processes in the years ahead. Other questions? Yes, sir. This may be kind of a, a fun question. You, you said in <laughs> earlier in your remarks <laughs> They've all you, been fun. Uh, that you thought the, the information age would end about 2020. That isn't all that far away, right. uh, at least for some people here. It's probably too far for me. But uh, <laughs> what do you think the next age will be? Bioengineering well, age. Bi say again? Bioengineering age. The, uh, the, the, the question is, what's the next age going to be? And then, and then the question is, why in the heck do I think that, probably? Um, well, first of all, the general consensus is the information age started in 1960. So what part of your question that wasn't asked, because you were being real kind, is why in the world do you think it's going to end in 2020 so soon? And if you study the history of the ages, the exact same thing happened in each of the ages at basically the same intervals. For example. The technology that drives any of the ages, you go back study the hunting and gathering age, the agricultural age, the manufacturing age, the technology that drives the age is invented in the first half of the age. There's no significant new technology invented in the second half of any of those ages. What happens in the second half of the ages is the integration of those technologies in an effective way. So for example, the information age is driven by three major general consensus of of futurists and historians out there is driven by three major technological areas, advances in television, computing, and telecommunications. And basically, it's all around chip capacity and, and, and other things like that. But in the first half of the information age, companies made billions of dollars in each of those distinct areas. Now, guess what happened? The telcos are trying to buy the movie companies. The movie companies are trying to get, they're trying to get integration through purchasing unless you're Bill Gates, and then you can be creative and create integration through creating new products. And those are the companies, if you want to invest in the stock market, go out and buy stock in companies that are effectively integrating those three technologies, and you'll do well in the stock market for a long time. That's a free tip. It's worth exactly <laughs> what it costs you. Exactly what it costs you. But I mean, that's, that, that's the key. So, if it started in 1960, you began to see that integration occurring in 1990. The other thing 
If you're a student of history in the ages, you know that there are major power shifts at the midway point in each of the ages. And some of my historian friends said, you know, I would never have guessed that Russia, communism would have gone under in Russia. I'd never have guessed that the wall would have come tumbling down. I'd never have guessed. All those things happened around 1990. And if they go back and study the history of the ages, at the midway point in all the ages, there were significant power shifts just like that. Major transformations in power. And so some of that was very predictable. So the fact that a lot of the things occurred around 1990 that occurred in the middle point of all the other ages makes me believe that we've passed the midpoint. And so if you know when the beginning is, even I'm not a math major, but if you did know what the beginning is and the midpoint is, you can figure out what the end is. So that's why I'm guessing, and I say guessing. And what did the guy say? He who lives by the crystal ball soon learns to eat ground glass. <laughs> so, um, you know, the bottom line is I think it's about 2020 in terms of it's going to run its course. And then you may say, why in the world do you think the next age is going to be bioengineering age? And I read weird stuff. One of the things I like to look at is copyrights, where the copyrights are going. Because if you track where copyrights are being issued, it'll tell you where the laboratory work is going and where the final products are. Digital Voice, I saw Digital Voice the first time in 1968 at Purdue University when HAL was the first talking computer. The neat thing was to go to the Electrical Engineering Building at Purdue and visit HAL. There were only two faculty members who could talk to HAL at that time. And HAL was bigger in this stage, I mean twice the size of this stage. And I got more power in my laptop than HAL had. You know, and digital voices now, IBM is rolling out their laptops with digital voice. You can buy a Mark, 4K or a Mark 8 Lincoln Continental now and get digital voice onboard computing. You say start and it starts. You want to change the temperature, you tell it to change the temperature. You want to listen to country western music, you know, it'll change. Whatever you tell it to do, it'll do. And it talks back. So, so but, that's, but that's where we are. In fact, we got an award, Fort Hay State University got an award from Educom as the first institution to use digital voice as a training tool, as a teaching tool. And we used it in foreign language. If you're taking a foreign language at Fort Hayes, you don't have to go to a foreign language lab. You pick the phone up and you call the mainframe computer and you punch in or dial in your assignment code. And the computer will speak perfect German, French, or Spanish to you. You follow along in the book. And when you get to the point of this assignment where you need to uh, do the work, you hit an asterisk or dial 1-1 one, one on a rotary, and that threw them. We were dealing with a Boston group that came out and worked with us to create this. And they said, what do you mean rotary phones? <laughs> and I said, guess what? You're in Kansas now, and we still got rotary phones in some places. And so we had to change the software and deal with the fact we got rotary phones in, in Kansas. But uh, not all places. We're not totally. I mean, Viv's home of Ellenwood, you know. I give her a hard time about Ellenwood, Kansas. but. <laughs> Out in the farm, they don't. It, it doesn't work. But anyway, the the, the bottom line is that uh, you know, as we as we look at all of this stuff, there is some phenomenal opportunities. And so what happens is you you speak German, French, or Spanish as a student. The computer digitizes your voice and stores it. And I've actually seen some of our foreign language faculty members walking down the 17th fairway at Smoky Hill Country Club with their cellular phone, doing their critique of their student's assignment in between shots. Because they can listen to the assignment and over-record their comments. They're not putting their, you're not putting the accent in the right place, I warned you. So what happens is the student goes to class, gets the assignment, interacts with the computer, does the assignment, the faculty member reviews it, provides the critique. Before the student goes back to class, they call in, get the assignment, listen to it, and hear the verbal comments on it. Uh, and that's what we won the national award for. But that's an example of how you can take technology and integrate it and use it as a teaching tool. And there's a lot of exciting things out there that can be done. And, uh, you know, and, and I think it, they could be done very effectively here because I got confidence in this faculty to be able to be creative and innovative and use these technologies. You may not understand why they work or how they work, but we can figure out how to use them. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. I want to direct a question to Mrs. Hammond and Good. give her an opportunity. And I would like to ask, 
not only how you saw your role as the president's wife, but if you have any special interest, causes, or activities that you would like to bring to the Western campus. No, he's. That works, okay. Um, actually, I, my role has been more of a support person. I work very closely with the staff in the president's office. We meet regularly every three to four weeks with Ed, with our director of university relations, with our director of alumni, the assistant to the president, um, the executive secretary. And we will work out three months in advance and we know what our objectives are. If we're doing a special fundraise, uh, fundraising, maybe we're entertaining the faculty and we need to line up nights to do that. Whatever our purpose is, we sit down and we program out what activities are coming up over the next three months and we meet every month so you know we go over a couple of months everyone knows what their responsibilities are who's taking care of this as far as a certain activity who's whose responsibility everything is um, i find it very easy to get things done when everyone knows what their jobs are and if we have um, certain objectives like fundraising um, you can pinpoint those things by working uh, with a group and knowing what everyone's doing my special interest um, i really love to play bridge and my mother-in-law will not go to the senior citizen center i do i go and play bridge <laughs> Uh, I have I've made some wonderful friends doing that uh, I took up golf uh, just so I could spend time with Ed but I also uh, have been involved uh, with the Ellis County Historical Society I don't do all these things at one time I found when we went to Hayes I needed a year to kind of uh, get used to the community we also had three children still living at home and so I kind of worked my way into different things uh, I've been on the Hayes Arts Council board I still am very involved with Special Olympics. In fact, to this day, we adopt one of the teams that come to play in the state basketball tournament and go and watch all their games. Uh, we make our uh, trip to Baskin Robbins. That's part of it. They, they know that we go to Baskin Robbins after opening ceremonies. Um, Ed and I have both been very involved with the United Way in Hayes. Um, my probably my special love right now is the Humane Society. Uh, all of our uh, little friends have been Humane Society breed. Uh, that's what we call them. Um, so I try to stay involved with the community. I am also a chamber ambassador. I understand that you have an ambassador program here, and I am one of the chamber ambassadors. So we do try to do things uh, with the community because we feel that is a very special. Uh, thing to, to have a good relationship between the town and the university. She does a lot more than that, but that's... <laughs> no, she's, uh, she's amazing because she'll uh, be out with uh, the grounds crew planting flowers sometimes. Uh, she'll... Uh, she, we have students, it's not unusual for me to come home now that all the kids, our three kids are gone, and she misses them, and so she'll adopt kids on the campus, and they'll be at the house, I'll come home, and we'll have pizza for different student groups at the house, and uh, I mean, they're our clients, and it's important that we know, know them, and we understand them. I, I make an offer. I personally go out and present every scholarship that we give. We do 15 scholarship receptions all over the state of Kansas, and we invite every parent and every student. And I take faculty with me. And so if, uh, if the student is majoring in history, there's a faculty member from history there, and myself, and the student comes up and we, take the, we give them the scholarship and make a big deal about it. And it takes a lot of time out of my schedule to do that. And we do a few hundred of these at each of these events. And then the pictures go in the paper, and we send the pictures to the kids. And, but what it does is it gives me the opportunity before the student ever reaches campus, and Viv goes along on some of those and meets the parents, and I make a deal with them. And, I, and I'd make the same deal if I came here. If they choose Western Kentucky University, I believe that places a special responsibility on us to deliver the kind of quality education that we like to brag about. And I tell them that if at any time they feel like we're letting them down, I want them to call me directly. 
And every year there are parents and students that call me about problems. And I guarantee you they get solved. It's something about when the president gets involved in solving a problem in our institution <laughs> that it gets solved. But you know what? It creates an attitude and atmosphere on our campus that is just phenomenal in terms of what the students want and what parents believe their role is in the educational process. And we'd probably do that here because I believe in that very strongly. Other questions? You mentioned, I think, that there were some 900 students taking courses uh, that would never set foot on, on campus at, at Fort Hayes. And that's out of a student body of, what is it, five or 6,000? Uh, yes, okay. 56, 5,800, depending okay. upon whether you talk about fall or spring. Or and do you envision that percentage increasing radically over the next, let's say, 2020? Would you say the average state institution in 2020 is going, what percentage would you say students would be taking classes in that fashion, it would never set foot on, on a campus? Uh, first of all, the average state institution isn't going to be a player in the year 2020. They aren't going to be around if they're average. But if you are able to develop a unique kind of environment so you can be a player, I've told the faculty at our, I open every year sitting down and talking with the faculty. That's how we start the year out. And we establish a theme. And this year the theme is partnership. And, uh, but it, in that partnership arrangement, we talked about our new faculty contractual relationship and how they can use it to make some extra money on the side if they really want to work. It's not really on the side with their supplemental contract that we've developed. But I predicted that if Fort Hayes State University continued to do what it was doing, it will be 100 years old in 2002, that we would have more students off campus than we have on campus. Now, I'm not saying that, the t that we would have less than 6,000 students on campus, but I believe in the state of Kansas, it's a slam dunk that Fort Hay State University will be servicing more people off campus than on. Because the Board of Regents just authorized us to go into Kansas City and Wichita and Topeka with our distance learning product, which we've only been able to offer in Garden, Dodge, and Liberal and Western Kansas. I mean, the towns I could name we go to uh, they don't have populations as big as this auditorium in some cases. But uh, going into Kansas City and Wichita and Topeka, we'll be addressing, and what's happened is the citizens in those areas are saying, we want this product too. And so uh, we, are, we are now able, at the September board meeting, they will adopt the policy changes necessary to let Fort Hayes go, uh, and any of the schools go wherever they want with mediated products. And it only makes sense. We don't do it. Right across the border to the west, you've got the governor of Colorado, the governor of New Mexico, the governor of Arizona, and Utah putting money in building virtual university. And if you don't think that the citizens here will use virtual university, you're crazy. If you don't have a comparable product or a better product, they're going to use the Western Governors Association virtual university, and those resources will leave the state. And people will begin to ask, taxpayers will begin to ask in the Commonwealth, why are we putting all this money into these state institutions? That's why I believe that this next 10 years is so critical for institutions like Western, and that's why I feel so strongly that uh, I'd like to be part of that change. Other questions? What do you see for Western in the area of economic development? The question was, what do I see for Western and, and economic development? I don't believe you can separate post-secondary education from the economic development strategies of, of states any longer. The future of the Commonwealth workforce depends upon whether we can raise the skill level in the workforce in Kentucky. That's what the governor, I think, understands. That's why the governor wants to do this. I mean, he, the governor, I think, likes higher education, but he's not doing this particularly because he likes higher education, but he wants to raise the skill level of the workforce in the state, and he knows that he needs to leverage his educational institutions in order to do that. He needs to coordinate and leverage those resources. You know, I don't know, has anyone ever been to Silicon Valley? Okay, it's a horrible place to live. I mean, it's dry, it's dusty. But you got Berkeley at one end and Stanford at the other, and as a result, the workforce there became very technically advanced which attracted businesses. North Carolina said, hey, 
we can do that too. So they created the research triangle intentionally. I and mean, that didn't happen by accident. If you think that happened by accident, you're kidding yourself. Or the Route 1 corridor in Massachusetts. That didn't happen by accident. And what's exciting about Kentucky to me right now is we're going to make a concentrated effort to accomplish the same objective here, to leverage the resources we have in post-secondary education to raise the quality of the skill level in the workforce, which will attract new industries, stabilize new industries, and bring the business of the future to the Commonwealth. It's a, it's a critical, critical decision the governor's made. And without that, I said, I wouldn't be a candidate here. Other questions? Seeing none, let me just say thank you very much for coming out and learning a little bit more about me. Viv and I have had just a ball this today and yesterday, and we're going to stay around tomorrow and visit with some people just because we want to learn more about Western Kentucky University. And, uh, and the schedule today really doesn't provide us that opportunity, so we asked and they said we could, we could stay around and meet with some people. Let me close by saying that I think this is a critical time for this institution. It's a critical time for you as faculty and staff, uh, and that uh, I believe that I'm a strong candidate because I bring to the table experiences. If you're a heart patient and need open heart surgery, who are you going to want to do the surgery? You're going to go find the doctor that's done it before and done it well and done it successful. That's what I bring to the table as a candidate. I've got 10 years of doing it well. Don't believe me, call, my co call your colleagues at my institution and ask them. That's what I bring to the table. I appreciate the opportunity and we look forward to working with you to make Western Kentucky University one of the truly outstanding institutions, not only in the Commonwealth, but in this part of the country. Thank you very much. <laughs>